Give that update. So they still can't. They still can't hear you. All right. Now, now they can hear us. All right. So I'll start that again. Okay. Uh, oh shoot. So that none. They, they didn't hear any of the introduction. No. Oh. No. Sorry. Let's start over. Welcome. Uh, we had a long hiatus. It's the longest we've gone without doing one, doing a, a show. But Jake's been away. Frick busted up his hand. He's much better. Tonight's episode, tonight's topic is on sharpening, in which I will simply say, sharpening is the key to allow you into the room of hand tool woodworking. Without it, you can't get in. None of these tools work, regardless of how good they are. So you have to know how to sharpen. So throw the questions at me, and I'll share with you whatever everything I know. Uh, that was Kenzie, my daughter, that blew through here a minute ago. Kenzie with us tonight. Luther's online. Super Dave's online. No, Super Dave's traveling, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah. And Jake walked in here about 15 minutes ago, having, after having been gone for the best part of a month. Now, the first question is coming from David. Yeah, in Austin, Texas. In Austin, Texas. He says, does it make sense to try and sharpen table saw blades yourself? And if so, are there any jigs or tips that Rob can offer? Uh, no, it doesn't make sense. Uh, table saw blades are relatively inexpensive. What do we pay to sharp? We get a blade sharpened. Do you remember? Twelve bucks. Somewhere between $12 and $20 to get it sharpened. Um, figure out what your time's worth. And I can't imagine under any circumstances that I would try to figure out how to sharpen a carbide blade today. So in my opinion on that is absolutely not. Not worth it. Okay. Next question, Frick. Uh, just one second here. I'm missing something. Uh, this one comes from Joel Albin uh, in Elkville, Illinois. Hey, Joel. He says, do you prefer diamond or CBN wheels? Also, about sharpening stones, do you like diamond sharpening stones? Oh, shoot. Let me repeat that. From Joel in Elkville, Illinois. Do you prefer diamond or CBN wheels? Also, about sharpening stones, do you like diamond sharpening stones? Well, as far as I know, there I don't know there is a diamond wheel. I think... Receiver died. I just charged it. Just one second. Hey, Tara, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So as far as I know, I, I've often referred to it as industrial diamond, but I don't think that's what it is. It's carbon boron nitrate, which I just tell people because that sounds so weird, industrial diamond, same thing. It's a real hard material, and yes, I love them. They're the best. I would never, ever go back to a regular uh, um, carborundum or whatever their stones are made out of for more reasons than just how fast it cuts. It comes already balanced. You're not sitting there... Stopping and starting your grinder, trying to get this thing to turn somewhat true. You never have to dress it. Um, it's certainly not going to fly apart on you. And it cuts extremely fast and extremely cool. It's like a big heat sink itself. So for that reason, it is hands down the best. Even though it costs almost uh, six, five or six times what a regular grinding wheel would cost, it's worth, it, I'd pay 20 times now that I've used it, if I had to do it to get another one. As far as diamond stones for sharp hand sharpening, those are, as far as I know, industrial diamond. And uh, yes, I like them. I wish somebody could make one that was ab absolutely flat. Uh, and that's the problem. You, uh, you have to deal with a stone that is not perfect, like a Shapton is. And we'll probably talk more about that tonight. But for sharpening just the edges of a chisel or a plane blade, yeah, they're great. They cut fast. They never, have to, they never go out of flat, meaning getting dished like a regular stone does. And I think everybody should have one in the shop because they're relatively indestructible. So if you're doing, for instance, if you're trying to sharpen an eighth inch chisel, 
there's such a small reference surface, it's really easy to dig that into uh, a small a ceramic or a water stone. You don't have to worry about that with the diamond stone. You can also sharpen your carbide router bits, which is something that I send out to be sharpened as well, but there's times when I need it and it's starting to burn and I have to f fix it. So that's where I would use um, that particular stone. So yes, have one. The only, the downside is when it comes to doing chisel backs, they're not as, they're not flat enough to give you that flawless surface on the back of a chisel. Next brick. All right. And by the, by the way, is anybody watching for vets tonight? Ken, are you? So if you're a combat wounded vet that has been to one of our classes, there's 95 of you out there, our alumni, and you're on tonight, would you please say hello so we can say hello to you? And just uh, what you do, you go into the chat and you put hashtag? No, at sign, at, at sign Ken. At sign? Ken. No, you, don't, you just mean at. Oh, yeah, right. You the at symbol. Ken, and he'll pick up on it and give and tell me so we can say hello to you. And uh, also tonight, our, 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 give, our giveaways, courtesy of Santa Claus, are coming from the shop of O'ConnorWoodworking.com. And Jeff produces, at least what we have tonight, is um, oak shaving brush with, what's the bristle, Jake? My boards badger, here. Badger, badger bristle. And this really co good soap and this bowl that you get to mix it in. We also have, he makes them in different, uh, he makes them in different, out of different woods. We buy them from him specifically for uh, this cause. And you can go on there and get it. This is a piece of uh, is, I think this is a piece of, uh, shoot, Jeff, tell me, I don't know. It might be lignin. I don't sure. Is it on the box? Nope. And giving away cutting boards from Bob Abbott, which is the vintage work, the vintage veteran.com. And that's Bob. What's Bob call this one? This one is called the drunken, the drunken cutting board, and this one is the three D, the three D one. And we'll give away one of those prizes for at every thousand dollar increment that we get we in uh, fundraising for our Purple Heart project, which keep your fingers crossed will resume in April. Okay, next question, Frick. Tell me when you're on, Jake. Yeah, he is. You're uh, not using the light anymore. It's not plugged in. I'd use the plug for the computer. Okay, so this one comes from John Root in Greenbrier, Arkansas. Hi, John. He says, you say in your videos on sharpening to use light pressure and describe it as starting to squeeze a grate. Any other way to tell how much pressure? When I use what I think you're describing, it seems to take forever. Um, well, I usually, ha you're not here, but I would have my student put their hand on the table and then I would push down on the back of their hand. And they would always say, oh, that light. So most, almost everybody does push this too hard. Maybe if I told you why I suggest that. What you're trying to do is you're trying to feel what's going on with your fingers. And the harder you push, the more difficult that's going to be. Obviously, it's got to be firm enough to get the thing to cut, but it can't be too hard. So when I said a firm grape, and you push down on a firm grape, it's going to allow a fair bit of, I shouldn't say a fair bit of pressure, but it's going to allow a moderate amount of pressure before it collapses. So go to the grocery store and get a really firm grape and then push on that, and that'll give you a feel. And I don't know what you're sharpening with, but if, you're, uh, if your stone's worn out, meaning if you're using a diamond stone, they do wear. If it's worn out, yes, it's going to be a lot slower. And if, depending on what grit, I always start my process... And I'm sure the question will come up tonight that will allow me to demonstrate this. But I always start my process with either a 500 or a 1,000 grit. And it should only take 10 seconds to do the job that you need that particular stone to do. So if you're, if you're not getting what you need in 10 seconds, then we need to visit what you're using for equipment. Next, Frick. All right. Next one comes from, I don't know why my mic is so low. 
All right, next one comes from Nick Brown in Bloomfield, New Brunswick. Oh, do we know Nick? <laughs> do. He's usually here. What's up, Nick? Okay, his question is, can you show how to properly sharpen carving gauge, gouges? Gauges? Gouges? Yeah. No, I can't. And I'll tell you why I can't is because I don't do it. Uh, I have carving tools, and I did a video with Chris Pye, but Chris taught it. And the reason why is Chris uh, had commissioned Norton to make specific stones for sharpening gouges. And uh, it was great because I think there was two stones that were square, and there was a different radius. So you had eight different radiuses to work with. So I, I'll tell you a little bit about it, but... I, I certainly uh, don't do it enough to demonstrate it. So here's your gouge. And this one wouldn't be up to Chris's standards, I don't think. But by the way, we have a video on the website that you can get that will take you all the way through that. But Chris does the outside, and he also uses that stone, trying to match it as close as possible to that radius. And he actually puts a, uh, a bevel on the inside of this as well, which doubles the use of, the stu of this chisel. And you have to watch the video in order to really comprehend that. But it was amazing how well it worked. Now, if you're, if you're buying a, uh, can, a slipstone that is, uh, you know, a, th a quarter of the radius of this, you're working one little surface and it's not very efficient. Whereas when you can actually match that stone to that radius, it works a lot better. And then what I was amazed at is that when we when we need to char sharpen, we go all the way back to the core stone. And Chris would simply go in there and he would would rehone using leather and and uh, diamond paste or whatever the honing compound was. So I'm sorry I can't demonstrate that for you, but if you uh, check out that video, you'll learn everything. And I think he's the best at it. And how come you didn't get invited to come up here tonight? Jake was away. Yes. Nick, anytime. <laughs> Go, Frick, next. All right, next question comes from Jim Delaney in Beaufort, South Carolina. He says, what about using float glass and lapping zone for initial polishing of chiselbacks and plain blades as to not wear out the more expensive uh, stones? Uh, what did he say? Float glass and what? Lapping zone. Well, you know, there's, there's all kinds of stuff out there today. The problem that uh, my issue with it is it's messy, it's not convenient, and I'm not worried about wearing out the stones because if you're doing chiselbacks, which is what uses your stone the most heavy, heavily, you only do it once, and your sharpening from then on is mere, mere uh, seconds. So they last a long time. But I'm not big into the film. I was never big into sandpaper on glass. I always thought that was Pennywise, dollar foolish. That paper's expensive. It doesn't cost you a lot to get one or two sheets. But when you consider you can only flatten a, a stone once or twice with a sheet of the paper, then it becomes expensive. And I want my stone sharpening medium to be hard so that it does not give it all under the pressure of the chisel. And on sandpaper and glass, you always have that little bit of give in the paper. What's the matter, Frick? My microphone's not working. Yeah, everybody's complaining about it. Just want to show you this. So this, uh, we did this YouTube. It hasn't been released yet. It will next week, I think. Made this little box. This is out of you, with a little strip of sapwood. So the question of the day was, what do you put in a U-box? My answer was useful stuff. Duh. Isn't that cool? I love that wood. Did you get the, did you get the proportions right on the hand? Uh, I, I purposely did this one. It's kept them all the same size. No, I mean, I mean the oh, yeah, I moved it. I moved it. I moved it. What Jake is talking about is, I'll show you. Uh, we're a little off topic, but it's all wood. It's all good. So when I did this one, you see how I, I didn't have my router in the right spot? So you see how far back the lid goes? And then you can look right down through. I don't like to see that. I like to have it stop right there. So all I had to do was move the fence 
a little bit closer. Farther away from the center of the bit so that there was more router bit cutting. And what that does is it moves the center of the pin, center of the dowel in this way, and that means it'll stop there. Love that, I love that you, and who, do you remember who sent it to us? Oh, that you? Yeah. Had a customer send us a whole bunch of this. So this is Pacific U. We, he probably sent us, oh, I don't know, eight, eight of these railway ties made out of Pacific U, so. We cut them up. No, they weren't railway ties. I just look like a real one. And Jeff has some. He's going to be making some U bowls and U shave brushes. You'll like that. Go ahead, Frick. All right. I'm on to you jokes. Next question comes from uh, Brian Proffer in Bakersfield, California. He says, is there a time when it is better Brian. to use a diamond stone, example, the 300 slash 1000 trend stone versus the equivalent Shapton glass ceramics? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. If you're doing carbide, anything that's carbide, if you're doing anything that's really small, and when I say really small, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, if I was going to sharpen, well, here, I've got, uh, I've got two examples. I've got an eighth inch chisel, and I've got one that I had taken down to 16th a long time ago. Well, if you try to sharpen that, you're almost for sure going to stick it into the stone. So on a diamond stone, you don't have to worry about it. So the, the best example I can think of is anytime you're sharpening something really narrow, the diamond stones are so much better. I would suggest that everybody have one of those in their shop because there's a lot of things that you can do. It's indestructible unless you let it rust. And if you're just using that, you can just use oil as the lubricant. Um, Frick, I, something I just wanted to say and it left me. What was it? Oh, so if, read out any, um, what do you put in a U-box? Just in case somebody comes up with a clever response, I'd love to hear it. The best, the best one I saw was IOUs. <laughs> Anything you want. Ed, Wils Ed oh. Wilson came up with that one. Anything you want. Oh boy, what did I start? Okay. Another question? Yep. Uh, David Potter in, I can't pronounce that, Poughkeepsie, New York? Poughkeepsie. Poughkeepsie. As, is it Paul or David? It is David. David. Do you polish? I you, remember his address. Do you polish the back of your drawer bottom plain iron the same way you polish the backs of your chisels? Nope. No. Uh, ruler trick. Rule of trick on any plane blade, with the exception of a scrub plane, because that's radius, won't work. But every any other plane blade, use the uh, use the rule of trick. Just speeds it up, changes the geometry by less than a degree, so you can't even tell, and uh, yeah, it just makes it. It becomes a seconds procedure instead of a uh, an hour long procedure. I don't know why anybody would not do it. That's David Charlesworth. Go to his website. DavidCharlesworth.com. David developed that technique way back in the mid '70s, way back, and it really only got popular or got exposure in 2002, 2003. I think that's when he, I was showing it. And once I internalized it, because I had been teaching the traditional way, so you're having to change your whole method of teaching, I realized this is the smartest thing I've ever learned about sharpening. So, David Charlesworth, smart man. Friend of mine. Next, Frick. All right. Next one comes from Dennis in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Hey, Dennis. I've not seen you clean the diamond plates nor the ceramic stones. What do you do with all the swarf? Uh, I don't. So I'm, um, I, I wouldn't call myself Im terribly impatient, but you can see this is a mess. As long as I can get access to this stone and this stone, that's all I care about. So when I'm busy doing something and I need my blade sharpened, I'm over here, quick, 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 get it done and be gone. So I always recommend that if you're going to do this, the all Shapton system, which is a Shapton uh, 500 or 1000 and a Shapton 16,000, get two heavy holders because that slurry will actually weld that thing on there and you can't get it off. And if you do get it off, you got a whole bunch of crud to scrape off 
in order to use the other stone. So by leaving it sit right on there, I just come in. I would start with the fine stone. This is the Shopton uh, lapping plate. This is the part that's so expensive. Come in here, spend three to five seconds flattening that one, and then come over to the coarser one. Same three to five seconds. Now you should rinse this off because if the uh, if this gets clogged up, these ways in here, it's a pain to clean them out, and it'll really slow down your your um, lapping. So that part you should clean. But no, I rarely ever clean it. And if you do need to clean this, let me find something I can set it on. So these are our own stones now. We went back to the originals. They're having some issues with the uh, flatness. You, they, they, you can get this little eraser. Any eraser. Any eraser, yeah. And that will do a really good job and fast of cleaning that up and making it look like new and that'll speed up the cutting. So there you go. Okay, next. Okay, next one comes from Jason Brown in California. Hey Jason. He says, any thoughts on use of a leather strope or buffing wheel with rouge as the last step after getting a tertiary bevel on a chisel or plane blade? It's funny, I had a piece of leather in my hand when you asked me that, I knew it was coming. No, I don't. I don't use a strop because of this. When I sharpen my blade, I want that blade to remain straight in two directions. I'll show you. If I look at it this way, I want it to be straight from here to here. I feathered my corners just a little bit, so technically it's no longer straight, but there's no dip in here. So when I start, or at, at the end of the first step, it is straight, shortest distance between two points from here to here. Then when I go to my tertiary bevel, I make it straight as well, but then I at the last step, I just feather off this corner, feather off that corner. So I want it straight that way. I also want it straight this way. And if you strop, you're working on that back side. So no, I don't do it, and that's the reason I don't. And the second reason, if you need a second one, if I can spend 42 seconds over here, 32 seconds over here, and that blade will produce a surface, shall we do it? Let me just show it to you. The, and you, what you have to bear in mind, Ken, I am out of paper towel. Would you see? I don't think I have any in here at all. Would you please? You, I, um, I used to go well beyond what made sense. And to explain that, what I mean is, if you produce a surface on that lid that your hand and your eye cannot see room for improvement, going beyond that is a total waste of time, law of diminishing return. You're not getting anything for the extra effort. So if my 32 seconds of sharpening will produce an edge that will plane this piece of maple, hard maple, such that I cannot f feel where there could be room for improvement, then why go any further? So let's test it and see. You're gonna have to rely on my, my uh, yeah. feel. Frick, you wanna give them a quick update on your finagers? I suppose I could do that. <laughs> um, so my hand is, my finger's still wrapped. I don't know if you can see in there. It does look it does look a lot better than it did, and uh, I'm gonna have a cool scar. It's gonna look like a lightning bolt. They told me. Anyway, I've started physio. I can barely move it. That's about as the extent as what I can do. The tendon hasn't healed yet, uh, but it's making progress slowly. I still have another 
seven or eight weeks before it's supposed to be a lot better. So, thank you. And no, I haven't touched a chisel since. We got him a set of rubber chisels for Christmas. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. Come to my 1,000, locate the primary bevel. I have four fingers on the cutting edge to distribute that pressure as evenly as possible. Think of that grape. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Now, I've got a burr. First off, what I want to tell you is that little wee tight circles. Don't go like that, then you're, you're rocking too much. Keep those circles nice and tight. And I can detect a burr, I can feel it with my finger that runs from corner to corner. If this is flat and the burr goes corner to corner, then providing the pressure was uniform, that should be straight from there to there. Now, I'm gonna jump all the way over to a 16,000. And I say all the way over, I'm meaning I'm gonna bypass any in-between stone. If this is flat and this is straight, when I set that blade down, find the primary bevel, come up a little bit higher than I was over there. What that now tells me is the entire edge is touching this. And that's why I'm able to skip those grits because all I have to do with this stone is get rid of those, any evidence of those 1,000 grit scratches and it's gonna create a very, very small third or tertiary bevel. Locate your primary, come up a few degrees higher same idea with the uh, tight little circles, although I'm going to move forward and back on this one a little bit, simply because I don't want to wear the stone out. It's probably 8 seconds, 9, 10. At the end of 10 seconds, I'm going to put downward pressure for 3 seconds on one corner, and then the opposite corner for 3 seconds. And all I did was push like that, and then push like that. Final step is to take a thin steel rule, set that on here, keeping it flush with this side of my stone, lay the blade on its back, stay within a quarter of an inch. That means don't have the edge of this blade come in more than a quarter of an inch from the edge of this stone. If you do, it messes with the geometry, and then you're gonna have a much steeper back bevel on there. As it is, that's less than one degree. Wipe off any moisture. Now, if I wasn't talking, you would have had 10 seconds and 10 seconds and three and three and three. What's that add up to? Yeah, and the other one was the uh, flattening of the stone. I admitted that. Put your chip breaker on. And get that to within about a 30 second. Everybody always wants to see that. Okay. Okay, watch out for the commercial. It's coming. Of course, the real key to fantastic planing is to have your very own... Magic wax, which simply cuts the friction. Now, first thing I got to do, and since we're talking planes, you'll notice that I have an adjust star. I got rid of that. I got rid of that uh, traditional adjuster knob right there, which is so hard to turn, and I replaced it. We developed this thing called an adjuster, and it gives you five spoke wheel that gives you some leverage and makes it so much easier. So I've got the blade parallel to the sole, then I'm going to retract it, and then I'm going to start planing. And while I'm planing, I'm going to slowly advance and watch to see where the first bit of shaving shows up. And it seems to be coming out of the middle. And I'll plane this until I get a consistent shape, or a 
full length shaving. Okay. So when I run my hand over that, that is as smooth as, as a, as a cell phone glass. So if I run my hand there and I run my hand there, this is smoother. Huh? Oh, that is so smooth. So the question was, do I strop? Well, if you're investing 32 seconds and you're getting this, why do anything different? Why, do, why add anything to that? It's not going to make it better to where you can tell if it even, if it even does. And it, you have that disadvantage, I think, of changing the shape. It's, I, I, we're, not, we're not sharpening a hunting knife or a steak knife. We're sharpening something that I want to produce a dead flat surface. That's the reason why. Next question, Frick. All right, next question comes from Chris in Long Island. Do you have any suggestions? Hey, do you have any suggestions for hand sharpening narrow chisels to avoid gouging? Yeah. Just before I answer that, Frick, are, are, can any any vets on? Yeah. Who? Uh, Bob Abbott. Here, here, Ken. Ken has to get his microphone. Bob Abbott's on. Now, now who's Bob Abbott? Bobbert. Do we know Bob Abbott? Do we ever? Bobbert is right here. Bobbert's had a rough week. Show him some love. Go on to the vintageveteran.com and get yourself a cutting board. They're gorgeous. I ordered some for myself. And, and, uh, oh, the world has been beaten up on Bob the last couple of weeks, but he's going to pull through and come out of it shining like a. Shining like a what? What do we use for an analogy there? Shining, Shining like a diamond? Di a star? You'll be fine. Stick with the ball. Uh, Eric Homerson's on, class of 21. Eric, a buddy in Newfoundland. Doc Bailey's on. Doc Bailey. Ray Dor. Medi or, um, um, Doc Bailey was Vietnam Navy era. Corman. Navy corpsman. Ray, and Ray Dor. Ray Dor, another, yeah. another Vietnam vet. Hey, Ray, haven't seen you in a while. Hope you survived. I guess there wasn't storms weren't where you were. Gary Burnett's on. Hey, Gary, down in Tennessee. And Jeff O'Connor's on. Jeff, now you got to show Jeff some love. My highlight of my week is when I pay my son, Bo, to give me the hot towel treatment and uh, and, he, and he shaves me with a not I won't allow him to use this complete straight razor, but one of those old fashioned ones. But uh, J Jake uh, last Christmas got me a bog, um, bog oak <coughs> brush and and, uh, and bowl set, and it's it's my stress relief. That sounds what? super dangerous. Oh, a vera wood? Yeah, it's like yellow. Yellow? Yeah. Not green. Because he uses it too much or not enough? Too much. Too much. It's from cutting all. It's from cutting through all that shrapnel. The what? The moisture must suck. Oh, real? Jeff. Who else? Ken. Kevin, not on. Kevin Burris. Danny Bell. Frick. Uh, the question was. Oh, sharpening a chisel. Well, here, let's go in and do this one. Craig, don't make this one. Actually, I'm going to, I'll take one of our own. Willie makes these for us. So the, the problem with this is that you have such a small amount of surface area, it's hard to keep the chisel from doing this. So this is where you really want to use a diamond stone just to keep from stabbing your chisel into the stone. Find your primary. I can only get one finger on there. Elevate it. Now, on these, instead of doing around like that, if you go around like that, I guarantee you're going to end up with a skewed chisel. It's hard enough doing it the way I'm going to show you. Find your primary, and then little wee short strokes. Light touch, because you're trying to feel. You want the entire surface or edge of that chisel working. Flip it over and have a look. And you can usually see, and I, I don't know if you can tell, but I was a little bit heavy on what would be the left side of my chisel. But it's not bad enough that I worry about it. Then I'm going to come over here, and I'm going to do little wee short strokes. 
Let me take a moment. Raised up just a little bit higher. I got a little wee polish strip at the end. And then the advantage of our eighth inch is we make them from a quarter inch. So you've got a lot more reference surface when it comes to polishing and grinding. the back. Yeah, and grinding. Because they, uh, the, the little, the, these ones like that are just, they have, they have a tendency to roll on you when you're trying to do the, the back. Probably the biggest thing is just a light, a really light touch. Just learn to have a really light touch so that you can hopefully feel through your fingers and be able to tell what's going on. Next, next question, Frick. Uh, next question. Is comes. the link in there for the draw? Uh, I think Luther's put it. Yeah. Okay, and we got, can't forget moose. So we're also giving away tonight your choice of a dead cat sweater, or, or the um, the blue. Purple heart golf shirts. Kevin Burris is here now. Hi, Kev. Okay. BurrisWoodworking.com. Check out Kevin's sub website. These guys are all just launching woodworking businesses, so uh, give them some support. They 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 deserve it. Ready? Yep. Bob Vogel in Highland, Illinois. Hi, Whoops. Bob. Oh, I picked the wrong camera here. So you got a question? Yeah. Do you use a micro bevel on your mortise chisels, and what do you sharpen them to? Yeah, I. Uh, um, I, okay, I'll grab a mortise chisel. So, in a way, your mortise chisel is not going to be used the same way that your beveled edge chisels are. And what I mean by that is they're used with a lot of blunt force. I mean, you're wailing on this thing, chopping down through. Nothing that you're touching with this is ever going to be seen. But you still want it to perform. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, true. They didn't hear you. No, Jake just said through wedge tenons. You do. You see. You see the outside, and that is going to be cut with this. So, as you can see, Jake has polished the back of this one. Get yourself a Jake. And you do want it to be sharp because when you're going in there, particularly on a, a, on a through wedge tenon where you're sloping the wall, you want that to hold. You're, you're cutting down through, slicing down through end grain. And if it's the least bit dull, it'll slide off and makes it very difficult. When you, if you look at the interior or get an interior view of a through wedged mortise, that slanted wall needs to be straight. If it bows out, if it, if it, if it isn't is anything but straight, you're not going to have a very good joint. You're either going to have a gap because your wedge will come up tight before it closes at the top of the joint. And if it's undercut, I'm not sure how you, well, I suppose it's possible to do it. You're not going to have the integrity of the joint because you're not going to have glue surface all the way down. So you want it nice and straight. In order to do that, you've got to have a sharp edge. So I don't bother with the sides. Go in and polish the back and then do the bevel the exact same way that you do a bevel edge chisel, meaning you start off sitting on the primary, raise up slightly, stone, and then on your fine stone for a tertiary bevel, flip it over, polish your back, and you're good to go. So I guess I could have rewound that and said, yes, they're done the same way. I want you to understand the reason because in the past I've said you don't really need to polish more chisels, but and they're going to work a whole lot better. The sharper they are, the better they'll work. And remember, you're pounding down through that end grain, and just it's advantageous to have it super sharp. Next question, Frick. Again? Oh, because you don't have a mic? Have you got a question for me to be thinking about? Okay, can you hear me? Yep. 
Our uh, Purple Heart Project is uh, something that we started in 2016. We bring, um, in a normal year, if you can remember what that was, we do six classes, one a month. It's a six-day class. And we run from early in the morning to late at night. It's all hand tools. And in every class, we bring in seven combat wounded veterans from anywhere in the world. They apply online. We, we triage it and try to find those who are most in need based on their, their uh, mental or physical state because we see both mental wounds and physical wounds as the same. Um, we cover their airfare to fly them in, their hotel while they're here. We feed them while they're here. Every vet goes home with, I guess, somewhere between four and $4,500 worth of premium tools, same stuff that I use. And thanks to Jack Lane and Chris Chahusky uh, and all of the members of the Bench Brigade, and there's well over 140 of them, I think, now. And a special mention to the, the New Brunswick version of the Bench Brigade, Jim up in Moncton has delivered us, I think, 10 benches. 10? There, there will be 10. I think he's got a couple more coming. And so these civilian volunteers procure the materials, build a bench to our specs, and then Jack coordinates it so that if possible, the individual that built the bench can actually personally deliver it to one of the vets that have been to our class. Um, awesome program. Awesome. And it's been tremendously successful. So people ask me, why do I do it? Well, I do it because of the way it makes me feel. First of all, I, I feel we owe it to them. And secondly, it, it's the way it makes me feel, being able to do that and help them. If you want to be able to participate and do that and you don't live here locally where you can come and bake cookies or do whatever else, then if you want to make a donation and pay for part of a vet's tools or part of his airfare or whatever it happens to be, we allow that through our Purple Heart Project. You donate right on our site so we don't lose anything in the fees other than the credit card fee. And... Uh, Join us. And thank you to those who have. We have lots of folks that uh, donate on a monthly basis, and they know why they do it. And uh, we appreciate it. The vets appreciate it. But you know what? We will never repay that debt. Try as we may. Okay, next question. Yep. Um, this comes from Bill in Sacramento. Bill in Sacramento. We're going to watch Kenzie sneak by here. Oh, she only has slippers. Do you want to say hello, Kent? Last time. <laughs> and you're taking your dog with you? Yeah. Bye, Maggie. All right, Bill, Bill in Sacramento says, how often do you work the primary bevel on your plane blade or bench chisels? It seems to me that unless you've caused severe damage to the edge, you should have to work the secondary bevel. Uh, hi, Bill. Um, the most common reason that I regrind, meaning work the primary bevel, is when the secondary bevel gets too long. Every time you sharpen, you're lengthening out your secondary bevel. Well, the whole purpose of a secondary bevel is to limit the amount of metal that you're having to polish. So as it gets stretched out, it's, I find it faster to go over, regrind. Excuse me. Regrind by shortening. You don't go all the way through. I just shorten that or make that secondary bevel narrower so it's just a little wee tiny strip and then start over again and it speeds up the whole sharpening process. Now when you're brand new and you first start, you're going to find that you have a tendency to be a little heavy, probably on the index finger as opposed to the pinky and you're going to end up wearing that side of this blade or the chisel more and you'll get it skewed so instead of it being square across the end it's going to be somewhat on an angle and that's when you're going to have to go in and regrind but that's the reason why i do it or if you drop it next question yep next question comes from grant caller in westlake ohio hi grant he says, when it comes to sharpening the various wood, wording, wood turning tools available today, would you please discuss CBN wheels and make recommendations about choosing grits? They are so expensive, I'm nervous about making the wrong choices. Uh, yeah, we get asked this a lot, and I don't mind talking about it because, as I've described it, there are, I've, been around, I've been woodworking for, I'm 60, and uh, I grew up with a father that was a... Uh, left teaching woodshop at a school 
to being a carpenter contractor. So I had tools and wood around my house since my earliest childhood memory. So I can confidently say I've been woodworking for more than 50 years and it would be uh, closer to 55, maybe even more because I was doing it preschool age. I tell you that only to say that there's not a whole lot that has changed. You can go back and look at a text that was written 100 years ago and the techniques and the tools are going to look the same. Most companies making tools today are just redoing old tools, updating them. So there's not a lot that has changed. Very rarely will something occur that makes a huge difference. Saw stop is one of those on the power tool side. They took a table saw, which is the primary reason for woodworking related injuries ending up in visits to the hospital. And they've essentially made it almost impossible to cut yourself on it. That's a game changer. The CBN wheel is a game changer. The problem has always been with grinding, and you, you have to have a grinder. If you're trying to uh, reestablish a primary bevel with a stone by hand, you are going to be there forever by a grinder. The traditional grinding wheel is porous, it's light, it, uh, it generates a lot of heat, and it goes out of shape. And when it goes out of shape, you've got to go in and through some method, you've got to reflatten that surface. And that's a pain. When you put the wheel on for the first time, rarely is it imbalanced. You'll find you have to stop the grinder. That usually takes about a half an hour for it to stop wind spinning. Take it apart, reposition the wheel, clamp it back on, start it again. And hopefully it's going to run true, but sometimes it might take you five or six or ten tries. Um, and it cuts relatively slowly. And it, as I mentioned, generates a lot of heat. So you're constantly worrying about burning or taking the drawing the temper out of your out of your cutting edge because of the heat. Well, CBN wheel, it's I don't know how long they've been available, but We've, we actually had our own manufactured, had some changes made. A CBN wheel is a solid steel wheel. It's heavy. I got one right here. So here's the eight inch wheel. I'm gonna guess and say that it weighs, it probably weigh, it could weigh 10 pounds. I bet it's, I bet it's somewhere between eight and 10 pounds. And the, uh, one of the greatest things about it is it acts like a big heat sink. So when you're grinding something, this is absorbing a lot of the heat. How do I know that? Because I can go through and grind, completely grind the new primary bevel on a chisel and never have to dip the chisel in water. It stays cool enough I can actually touch it. Now, um, Jake went to work with the company that makes these. What did we go? We went to 80 grit or 60? 80. Okay, the ones that were, that were being offered were 120. So we went to 80. Um, you gotta remember, your, and I know you asked about lathe chisels, but when it comes to plane blades and chisels, the primary bevel never touches the wood. The primary bevel is merely uh, an angle that makes it easier to access and process the very leading edge. So the surface quality of the primary bevel is not an issue. The faster you can grind it, the better. So I don't worry about this being 80 grit. Um, what I was gonna say, what Jake had them do is not only do you have abrasive here, but you also have a wide strip here if you wanna grind something with a flat bevel. And we, we got them to do this edge as well. So you actually have three edges that you can use. So uh, as far as doing it for um sharp uh, pardon me lathe chisels i do my gouge on there and uh, i think it works great again it's fast it lasts a long time you never have to dress it just buy it buy it you'll love it you can't go wrong you really can't go wrong with it as I said, I think that's one of the few game changers that have come along in the last 50 years that I've been around woodworking. Next question, Frick. Yep. Uh, we sell them on our site, by the way. 
In fact, we all have we got the six inch listed yet, Jake? Yeah. We are, we are we brought them in in six inch diameter and an eight inch. So depending on what. Uh, in fact, what else did we recently get that helps with that? Adapters. Yeah, what's the adapter for? Oh, just to if go for a different size shaft. Eight inch. If you have a six inch, you can put it because the six inch wheel has an, a five eighths arbor. And so it's a five eighths to have. Are they hearing inch. you? Yeah. Okay. So we, you can either get it in six or eight, depending on what your grinder is. Go ahead, Frick. All right. <clears throat> this question comes from Dan in Jefferson, New Jersey. Hi, Dan. He says, Are there any plain blades or chisels that you don't put a micro bevel on? Are there any plain blades or chisels that you don't put a micro bevel on? Mm -hmm. um, no, not no plain blades that I can think of, and no chisels that I can think of. I even put a, I even put a, a micro bevel on my cabinet scraper and my card scraper. Figure that one out. Go ahead, Frick. Next. How many people do we have on? We have 850. And how many likes do we have? Only 248. And tell me again, why do we want likes? It helps promote our channel and our videos. It's a log uh, al algorithm thing? Yeah, the percentage of likes, uh, it's more likely that uh, YouTube will promote it on and its own. And what do they have to do in order to like us? Click the thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe as well. There you go. There you go. Give me a like. And don't forget to hit that notification bell and so you don't know. don't forget to hit that notification bell. So you know when we go live or release a new video. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, next question. Okay. Jarek Kersmininski. Interrupt me when somebody's there to give a shout out to, please. Okay, Frick, let's make the switch too. Yep. Switch cameras. Okay. Sorry, Frick. Say that again, please. I interrupted you. Yep, Jarek in uh, Poland. Hey, Jarek. He said, what's the difference between making a tertiary bevel on the six, or uh, sorry, on the 10K Shapton versus the 16K Shapton? Uh, so what's the difference between what? What's the difference between making the tertiary bevel with the 10K Shapton as opposed to the 16K Shapton? No difference. Well, no, it, yeah. <clears throat> the only difference is the, uh, the level of uh, sharpness. You know, the, uh, to answer that question in a simplified way, what's the difference between sanding up to 120 grit or sanding to 320 grit? No, no. He was saying what's the difference between making the tertiary bevel? Well, the, I'm not, process I'm, I'm making, not, the process of making the tertiary bevel on either a 10,000 or a 16,000. Well, yeah, your tertiary bevel is done on your final stone, whichever it is, whether it's 8,000, 6,000, 10,000, 16, 32, whatever. It's all done the same way. There's no difference. I thought you were talking about what's the difference in the cutting. You're going to get a better edge off of the 16 just because it's, a, it's finer, same as that was my analogy with sandpaper. And you're up late, but thank you for joining us from Poland. Next, Frick. Okay, let me see. Uh, Christian Estrada in Guatemala. Hey, Christian in Guatemala. Says, how do you know when it's time to replace your trend diamond stone? Mine has been used for years, and after checking it with a straight edge, I found a hollow in the center. Um... I, I replace mine when this... When this I'm, I'm impatient... And um, when it doesn't cut, I mean, it'll last a long time, but it will eventually wear. And when it no longer cuts fast, then it's time to replace it. As far as a hollow in it, um, they're, like everybody else, they have a standard that they work to. And as long as the stone falls within their tolerance, then it's acceptable. This is a hard thing to, to address. But if you want the absolute flattest, Here's your two options for keeping your stones flat. You have a diamond plate, or you have the Shapton lapping plate. This is glass with diamond embedded in it. This is extremely flat. This will allow you to make the backs of your chisels look like a single surface mirror. You may never get there with this. And the difference is the level of flatness. It's that precision that you pay the difference for. By the way, this is $140. 
This is three hundred and sixty. Three hundred and sixty dollars. The only thing you do with this is flatten your stones. If you're really fussy, you better get that because you'll drive yourself nuts otherwise. I, I, I'm often asked, "What's the difference?" Oh, I'm going to guess and say a five to seven percent improvement with with the uh, Shapton glass. So these are not going to be dead flat. They'll be close. And when it comes to doing the cutting edge of a chisel or a plane blade, you're not going to notice a difference. You're going to notice the difference when it comes to preparing the backs of your chisel. That's the single biggest difference. But kind of going back to the original part of your question, I replace them as soon as they stop cutting fast because I, I am impatient. Next. Oh, no, it's 8 o'clock. Ken, who do you have? Take the mic here, Ken. And we need to say hello to Angie, too. So if you don't know who Angie is, Ken has a cousin. And he has two cousins, Angie and her sister Lynn. And they live on the other side of the city. And uh, Angie is a big fan, so we made her a big employee. In fact, she was employee of the year last year. You see her with her, with her new uh, RC woodworking hat that was designed by Jake and somebody else. And Angie does, they, so Angie and Lynn package all of our Purple Heart t-shirts. Oh, Frick. Frick was the other one. Frick was the other one. Well, you said designed by Frick and somebody else. Oh, was it? I thought you were going to say Frick was the runner-up for employee of the month, of no. the year. No. No, no you wasn't didn't. Even wasn't, even, <coughs> wasn't even running. <laughs> yeah, blood all over the floor. That was the description. So this is Angie. Angie, a big shout out to you. And you'll see when you buy a t-shirt, it'll always be neatly, very neatly wrapped. Probably the neatest wrapping we even have here. i got to be careful because Ken's wife and Gina do the wrapping of the packages. But it's always neatly done. There's a little picture of Angie up there and a little A on there. That's her seal of approval. Thank you, Angie. And Happy New Year. Who do you have, Ken? Uh, Kevin Burris is on. Hey, Kev, I, I mentioned that. I told okay. everyone to go to BurrisWoodworking.com. Right. Michael, Kev does... Kev right? does Kev's really into uh, laser engraving, and he does it on all kinds of materials and makes urns. Just check out his stuff. As a favor to me, check out Kevin uh, um, Burris Woodworking. That's B-U-R-A-S woodworking.com. Go to the village, part of the village veteran. The veteran woodworker.com. That's, uh, that's um, uh, Bobbert. And go to O'Connor, O-C- How's, how's Luther spell it? I don't know. Don't, don't do it that way. Yeah. Is it, isn't Bob a vintage veteran? Yes, no, what is it? The vintage veteran, yeah. Yeah, you said veteran woodworker. Oh, sorry. It's the vintage veteran. Put those links in there, would you? And then go check out O'Connor Woodworking. That's Jeff and see his stuff. And um, uh, Danny Bell will be along shortly. So you'll be able to check out Danny's as well. All four of these guys are uh, combat wounded veterans that are good friends of ours that we're, uh, we're in a little partnership with. Uh, another guy, Michael Delvoy, he is a Vietnam vet, 69 to 70. He wasn't in a class, but he's a Vietnam hey, vet. Hey, Michael, thank you for your service, brother. <coughs> we appreciate it. Philip Lawrence is on. Hey, Phil. Sneaky Pete. Sneaky Pete. And Ahmed. And Ahmed. Ahmed's a veteran of dealing with Luther. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he's got PTSD. And among all the comments tonight so far, probably the number one comment Was? would be that you have long pants on. I have long pants on. Well, I'll tell you the story behind that. Just um, <laughs> So Ahmed supplies a, is, our, uh, is our wood go-to guy. And all these beautiful handles that you see me making all come from Ahmed. And he, I don't know where he finds it, but wow, the stuff that he pulls off. Good friend down in Southern California, so howdy, Ahmed. And uh, it's, we had, yesterday there was no snow on the ground. We've had a real easy winter. We got slammed this morning, late last night with a, with a snowstorm and the snow was uh, knee deep or deeper. And I had, I left here last night at one o'clock in the morning. I hadn't, uh, there's no windows, so I didn't see what it was like outside. And I had to go shovel the car out and I was cold because I had shorts on. So I had to wear pants today because I knew I was going to have to do more shoveling. So that's why. But I can't stand them. Go ahead, Frick, next. All right, next. Ken, am I forgetting anybody? I said Santa Claus. I mentioned Santa Claus and his wife. Wonderful supporters of the Purple Heart Project. 
And I want a big shout out too to uh, John Peckham who uh, did me a favor today, much appreciated. All right, Michael Graham in Davenport, Washington wants to know what, hey, the, what the difference is between using your angle trainer and a sharpening jig. Oh, that's a really good question. So oh, my, pardon? We've got both, don't we? Oh, you mean here to show? Yeah, uh, Ken, can you run and grab that? The, uh, oh. the honing guide. Uh, we keep Ken in shape. The honing guide and, a, and an angle trainer. A really pretty so one that... that uh, Tony's made. One that the magnets are glued in with? Yeah. <laughs> yeah Big shout out to Tony who never watches. So I have two combat wounded vets that work here. Al McGinnis, Al, Al McNeil. Al works two days a week. Al, I, I may have told you, that's that big 105 millimeter sabo round behind me. That was his first round that he fired. Al was a uh, tank commander in the Canadian Army. His last tour in Afghanistan as a result of a suicide bomber. He, uh, he was wounded, so he works here. And Tony Bahador, who is another combat wounded vet, 22 years, I think, as well, multiple tours. And Tony works here two days of the week, three days of the week now. What was the question? The difference between, the difference oh, between oh, yeah, your yes, yes. angle trainer yep. and a sharpening jig. So my, my beef with any kind of a jig is it robs you of the learning experience. Now, uh, I, would, I would work because I enjoy the process. I enjoy developing the skill. I enjoy being able to sit back and look at something, admire my handiwork. I don't care if anybody else cares or not. It's a sense of satisfaction, and you get that when you look at something you've done. David Pye, English craftsman, coined the phrase, workmanship of risk. That means start to finish, the outcome is dependent upon your skill. If you're sending a board through a thickness planer, you don't have a whole lot to do with the end result. If you're clamping a blade into a little jig like this, thank you, Ken, you don't have a whole lot of, um, you don't have a whole lot uh, of credit uh, for the, uh, the result. You just want a blade? Hmm? Yeah. yeah. So what you would do <laughs> is you would put that in place lock it down and it sits on the stone like this and you move it forward and back and that holds the angle and that's fine if this thing breaks or you lose it in 10 years time you have to go buy another one because you've never learned how to sharpen i teach you how to do it freehand so the angle trainer is designed to not interrupt your the way you hold it so you'll notice on the are we selling angle trainers with this commercial now? You'll notice on the angle trainer, there's a 29 degree slope on one side. There's a 31 degree slope on the other. There's two really powerful rare earth magnets in there. Don't, so don't, don't. Oh, because it's brand new? Yeah. So you would set that on your stone. You would hold the blade the same way you would if you're doing it freehand. But as you engage the magnets and slide it forward, it helps to support that angle but it doesn't interfere with how you would hold it. So you're going to do through the same motion you would if you weren't using it. When you go over to the fine stone, you turn it over to the 31 degree side, and now you hold it the same way you would if you were freehanding. Engage the magnet, slide it forward. Now you're up two degrees higher, and you're able to go in, do your tertiary bevel, downward pressure in one corner, downward pressure in the opposite corner, and in a month's time, this thing is going to wear out anyway because you're running it over a stone. Well, when it's gone, you don't change anything. You're still holding the blade the same way. And by then, you should have gotten comfortable enough that you can now do it freehand. And you have developed a skill that will speed up the process of sharpening. It'll make it more satisfaction, satisfactory because you did it. You actually did the whole process. Um, I remember, I remember when I first started teaching um, this hand tool class and we would produce, in the class, we would produce a little box like this, a little candle box. And all parts of this candle box started out as a piece of rough lumber. You know, the visual effect is always good. So we're dealing with a piece of pine like that that came right from the mill. It's been dried, but it's... It's not been dimensioned. We would 
take a scrub plane, a jointer, a smoother, winding stick, straight edge, and we would process it so that we had one, two, three, four flat true boards. And then we would cut the joints all by hand and we would cut the little groove that the lid slides in. And we would process the bottom piece and slip it into the groove. And then we would process the sliding lid on top. And when you were done, it cost about $4,000. But it was all you. And it represents your skill. That's a kick in the pants. That's why I do it. Next, Rick. Uh, before I read the question, I just want to give a shout out to Steve Beck, who is I know Steve Beck. Yeah, he's rallying the troops here in the chat to make donations. So oh. he recommended everyone uh, uh, make the at least the one time donation of ten dollars. And if everyone did, we'd raise over eight thousand. And a lot of people are doing that. So oh, that's great. Thank you, Steve. Thanks, Steve, for doing that. <clears throat> they thank you. Uh, Bill in Minnesota wants to know what is Hi, the Bill. best way to make and keep Forstner bits sharp. Ooh. Uh, don't don't use them. <laughs> well, um, I love Forstner bits. I just love the way they cut. Now I don't. Oh, my my old ones aren't here. Oh, my oh, my old old, old old ones I've had for a long time. Ken. Yeah, uh, they're they're they they are they 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 the long ones. Th uh, where are they? Are they the long ones? Yeah. They're in that they're in that cabinet just to the right of the branding branding drill press on the wall in that cabinet. So it's a, uh, the Forstner they're bits. They're like a long shank, like a six inch shank. They're they're not the uh, they're not the new ones I have that have the uh, the wave on them. These have teeth. Okay. Sharpenable teeth. Are they in a box or? it's in that it's in that thing on it's in that cabinet on the wall. It's on the bottom shelf. You'll see them there. Big, tall, portion of it. Um, I'll wait for Ken to come back, and then I'll, we'll, I'll address that. Next question, Frick. Uh, Danny DeLott in Oakland, California. Hi, Danny. He says, how do you prep the back of a marking knife, and how do you sharpen one? How do you prep the back of a marking knife? Okay, so I, I, I think he's talking about a striking knife. Um... Because if he's talking about my marking knife, I never sharpen it. But I'll take. Well, you get two to pick from. No, grab the other one too that has the the angled blade. The single? Why? Same thing. So if I was going to sharpen this, I would go on my stone, and I would prepare the back. Now I keep my finger right up there, and I would just run that forward and back. Now I'm doing it at an angle because anytime you're working with a narrow blade, if you try to do it like this, it has a tendency to want to roll on you. So hold on a 45 like that. And I would take that. Oh, that's good. Thanks, Ken. Take that until it's nice and clean on the back side. And then if you want to, you won't do. Come over here. Who said that? You won't do. Was it? Was that Forrest? Won't do. You could have gone through an, an in between grit, but I would take that and I would polish it up to my 16,000. Now it's going to be tough because you've got small bevels, but you're going to sit in there, try to find that primary bevel. Holy smokes, there it is. Just mention real quick what you spray on your stones. Hone right. Straight hone right. No. Hone rate and water. Hone rate is a water additive. That inhibits water, uh, water from rusting metal. So this is hard because you don't have much reference surface. And then you're going to come over here and do the same thing on the finer do stone. To, do you need to do that? Yeah, you don't have to, but if you want to be extreme, you can. Do you want to be persnickety? Yeah. Super Dave, doesn't. he's not on, right? No. So we're not allowed to talk about him. No. <coughs> Jake and Megan just came back from Utah. They were there for Christmas with Little Moose, and they spent the last couple of days at Super Dave's. So now that's, that's nice and sharp. Now, back to the question on how to do the Forstner bit. I bought these bits when in 1986. 
86 or 87, so I had them a long time. And uh, they're, e they're easy to sharpen, and they're just, they cut well. These were expensive. I remember, I mean, I, fortunately, at some point in my career, I learned that it's better to save the money and buy it once than to uh, end up having to buy it multiple times because you didn't buy it properly the first time. So I need to take a s small, relatively small file. And uh, so the part that does the cutting, the center spur is what's going to hold it and keep it from wandering. The, this, this is the cutting face of each tooth. Right? And then this is the one that cleans out the waste in between. So to sharpen these, uh, I didn't get that up high enough. Can you use a, can you use a diamond stone too? Uh, I don't know. I, I need my headgear so I can see. Ken, did you ever find that glass cleaning stuff? Son of a gun, huh? So I was going to come in here like this. And it always helps if you take a uh, felt tip and paint that surface. So you can see where you're, where you're cutting. I didn't mean to take off that top like I just did. Now I suppose you could go in and touch these if you got one that was too high, but I prefer just to do that face. You go all the way around. If you have to come in here and touch this up, again, paint it with the marker. It's easier to see. You should never have to touch this except for the fact that if you accidentally hit something. Hit something. And you certainly don't want to take it out of center, so you got to be careful. And then the final thing is you're going to, you're going to, you're going to, I don't have a vice here that I need. You're going to take a flat chisel, flat chisel. How about a flat file? And you're going to plant. You're going to. You're going to work that face. You really can't get down in there. Shouldn't have to. Work that face, and you're going to wear it that way. And when you sharpen them up, they'll cut just lickety split. And you can feel on the top when they're sharp. They they'll they'll grab. That's all there is to it. Now, the, the new ones I have, I haven't even attempted to do those because I'll show you why. These are made by fish. Just grab the drawer. Uh-huh. Out of, uh, let me blow the dust off this. Out of Australia. Austria. Austria, put another shrimp on the bobby. Yeah. Now, this is called a wave cutter. So I don't even know how I'm, I would, I'm going to have to sharpen these, but it doesn't have that same tooth, but it cuts nice and clean. I can easily, I, and it's got double cutters. So I can, easily, I can easily sharpen these, but getting that outside perimeter, it almost looks like having to go in. And the traditional Forstner bit, that's more of a sawtooth bit. You had to go in and scrape in order to sharpen them. And I think you have to do the same thing this way. My answer would be I'd buy a new one. Next one, Fred. Yeah, next one comes from Lisa in Hillsboro, Oregon. Uh, I used to live in Hillsboro, Lisa. She wants to know, how do I sharpen the curved blade on my scrub plane? Curved blade on the scrub, curved blade on the scrub plane? Where's my, here's right here. This is really easy. It looks complicated, but it isn't. Now this is another time when you're gonna want your, uh, your diamond plate. And this is like sharpening an axe. I don't I see. I can't think of a reason why I would spend the time to polish my axe up to sixteen thousand grit. And this operates like an axe in that you're just using it to hog off material. So the back of the scrub plane blade is going to be done the same way a chisel's done. No ruler trick. If you did a ruler trick on this, you'd end up with a little flat spot out here, and you wouldn't touch there because of the radius on the end of the stone. So you can go all the way through. Polish this flat, take it right up through the grits. Why? Why? Oh, oh yeah, ahead. that's right, too. I just <clears throat> sorry, I was talking without thinking. You could stop at a thousand. 
And you so, don't even need to you don't even need to flatten it. You just need to remove the burr. Yes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to sit on the primary bevel and I'm on way over here in this left corner and what I'm, while I'm doing these little circles, I've got to roll around the perimeter. So I'll find that primary bevel, raise up just slightly, start there. And while I'm doing that, see I'm right here now. I'm right here now. Get to the other side and then I'll use I'll come back. Now if you did it right, you should be able to feel a burr. And I can't feel a burr on the first half, so I'd go in there and do that again. Tight little circles, but I'm rolling around there and then go in polish it off now you can see when I clean this off you can see that little so I only use a secondary bevel you see, can you pick it up mm -hmm. and that's that's all you need in order to make that scrub plane work and I'll uh, prove it to you <laughs> And this is a beveled down plane, isn't it, Frick? Yep. What happens if it's a bevel up? Do you remember that? Then the bevel is facing up. Do you remember the time you oh, tried yes. to use this with the bevel up? <laughs> yes, thank you. Was it fun? If I remember correctly, it still worked a little bit. Uh, Just not if I remember correctly, you got stuck. Oh yeah, that's true too. Bring that blade out a little more. You can hog through a lot of wood quickly. And no finish, no part, no surface coming off of there is going to be left unless you're doing something like that. So that's why I don't bother taking that up to 16,000. Not necessary. Next, Frick. Tower uh, numbers. Uh, we're at 876. Haven't hit 1,000? No. We had over 900 there for a little while. Uh, Todd Michael in Leesdale. Hey, Todd. Says, what is your opinion on hand sharpening versus machine sharpening, such as using a Tormec? Uh. Um, oh, boy, so slow. Uh. Well, I don't know how many people I've taught to sharpen, but it would be well over, well over uh, three or 4,000, just based on the number of classes. And um, everybody comes out being able to do it. So if I'm working here at the bench and when I'm building something and I'm getting, I'm, I'm in that zone, I really don't want to be stopped. I'm, I'm doing something and I'm full steam ahead. So your plane blade, and this is going to be a long answer, but bear with me. Your plane blade has to be made so that it's hard enough to hold an edge, soft enough to be sharpened. So if you were to graph that, when you get your blade perfectly sharp, it's way up here. I call that um, finishing phase. That will cut a piece of wood so that you don't have to sand it. It is flawless. And as soon as you start to plane, you start to lose that. And it rapidly drops from that finishing phase down into what Chris Schwartz coined working dull. And that means it will still cut wood but it's not the finish you're going, that you're striving for. And as it continues to degrade, it uh, the graph a little more looks like this. It drops off really rapidly, kind of levels off a little bit before it tapers off and you end up with just dust and a lot of blade advancing, advancing in order to just keep it engaged in the wood. So my philosophy is up here is the most pleasurable place to work. The sharper the blade is, the less effort is required. The sharper the blade, the better the finish. The sharper the blade, the more control you have. This is fun. As it drops down, this becomes work. You're pushing harder, you're having to advance the blade, 
it's digging, it's catching. If the wood's gonna tear, it's gonna tear when the blade is cutting edges down here, not so much up there. So what do I have to do in order to keep the blade up there all the time? If I have to go over to a Tormac and set that thing all up and turn it on and watch that stone go round and round at about five RPM, I can't do that. But if I can go over there and in 30 seconds of sharpening and a, to a total of a minute, I can be back working, that's what I want. So I, I don't have any, uh, I don't have any use for anything in my sharpening system except a bench grinder with that CBN wheel to reestablish primary bevels and my stones over here, that kit that I, I sell because that's what I use. That gives me the best edge possible and it's fast, 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 fast. I don't care what things cost as long as they produce, they perform and they do it quickly. And that's why I use what I use. That's why I share with you what I use. I don't sell anything that I don't use. I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a um, what are those people called that advertise products? Influencer. I'm not an influencer. We, everything we sell is stuff out of, directly out of our shop that we use. So that's a long answer, but no, I don't use a Tormac. And the biggest advantage, you know, the advantage of a Tormac was you can never burn your blades. Well, you know what? With those CBN wheels, you have to really try to burn your blade. So that, uh, that advantage has gone out the window. Next, Frick. Next question comes from uh, Kevin Kelly in hi, Toronto. Hi, Kevin. And Toronto. His, his question is, uh, excellent performance of a plane is all about how well an iron is sharpened. How much do the thicker IBC plane irons play a role in this? Well, the uh, so let's give you some numbers. The, a blade out of a a blade out of an old Stanley plane. What happened to all the ones I had up there? What do you mean? An old Stanley plane would have had a blade that would have anywhere from eighty-five to, pardon me, seventy-five to eighty-five thousandths of an inch thick. Piece of writing paper is four thou, so that's not a really thick blade. The blade on a, the standard blade on the Wood River is 120 thou. The IBC blade is 140 thou. So you definitely are going to see a big difference going from 75 to 120. I can't convince. I, I can't feel good about trying to tell you that you're going to see a huge difference going from 120 to 140. Definitely want a thicker blade because it's going to be more stable. It's not going to have a tendency to vibrate as much. And it gives you a larger primary bevel. And the reason why you want a long or a large primary bevel, that's, what you, that's your reference point for sharpening. You always reference back to your primary bevel and then raise up a couple of degrees beyond that. Those little tiny, those little thin blades had little wee short primary bevels and it was very, very difficult. Not only that, but they would actually, the blade itself would flex under the pressure of your fingertips. Had no use for them whatsoever. So if you're asking me, would an IBC blade be better than a Wood River blade? Uh, it probably is, but it's also three or four times the price. Is it three or four times better? No. Next question, Frick. Uh, this one comes from David Pisarski in Costa Mesa, California. Hi, David. He says, how much radius are you putting on your blade to help eliminate blade tracks? Oh. Um, you, you know what? I, I don't think you can. Well, yeah, you can. You can see it. If you put it up to a straight edge, you can just see it. But I'm doing this. I've got. Uh, that's a. Uh, that's a. Uh, high angle. High angle blade. Here. I'll. I'll do it so Here. that you see. Oh, you got one there. Yeah. So this is a. Um, this is a sixteen thousand grit stone. It doesn't cut very fast. And the extent of my, the extent of my um, feathering is this. I'm out here, one, two, three seconds, pushing down with that finger. And then one, two, three seconds, pushing down with this finger. So how much difference is that going to make? Not a lot. Uh, <coughs> but, but it will make enough difference because that edge is nice and straight. 
and anything you do to the outside corners that you don't do in here is going to lower that blade and allow you to make those overlaps. The biggest single problem with eliminating the overlaps is people's ability to get that blade parallel to the sole. And I, I, it, I, wow. Every time I teach a class, some guy, I'll go over and he's got these real heavy plane tracks. Ah, I can't get rid of them. And he keeps going back and forth sharpening. And I turn his plane over and I look down and I see the blade sticking way up over here and then nothing over there. And I show it to him. And it's like, uh, I don't see what you're talking about. And I said, well, look closely. And it's, it's amazing how some people have a difficult time seeing something that I think is so obvious. But, you know, if you've never done it before, maybe so. So you need to learn to be able to see that blade and make that adjustment. One of the things I like about the Wood River Plains is they copied the original Stanley Bedrocks. So the lateral adjustment lever actually has a, a, a bearing on there. And that bearing, that bearing sits in that long slot, but it reduces the friction because instead of metal grinding on metal, you've got that bearing moving for you. And it allows you to go in and make a very, very fine adjustment so that you can actually get the edge to be parallel to the sole. And this thing will work the way it's supposed to. But if you're having a problem with plane tracks, that would be the first thing that I would check. And if that proved to be not the issue, then it's if you take your blade and uh, carefully, I don't like doing this to the edge of a blade, hold that like that up to the light. And if you, you what will happen oftentimes is you'll see light in the middle. Well, if you see light in the middle, then you don't have a straight edge. I almost, I almost started answering a different question, but you gotta be able to see just a little bit of light out in those outside corners to know you've got it perfect. And I'm surprised how uh, people pick up on it really quickly, so it doesn't take long. But check the lateral adjustment, that's almost always your biggest problem. Next, Rick. All right, next question uh, comes from Jerry Staub in Brighton, Tennessee. Hi, Jerry. He says, what is the thickness of your sharpening station platform, and have you ever had to replace it after extended use? No. Yeah, three quarter, a piece of three-quarter ply, usually exterior, so that uh, the water doesn't bother it. I mount it, uh, the, the block here, I cut about a one or two degree angle on there just so that it slopes ever so slightly away from, now, I think Jake did this, but I got a piece of rubber on there just to keep the, the water and mess off of the end, end of my bench, but three quarter inch piece of plywood, 12 by whatever width you need in order to hold everything. So I, I always screw and glue it. If you just screw it, there'd be a little bit of flex in there. But if you screw and glue it, that's just like welding it and that'll hold and never had to change it. Next for. Okay. I just had one. Uh, Jim Wisegrom in Portland, Hi, Oregon. Jim. He says, when you sharpen... I lived in Beaverton. When you sharpen the edge a second, third time, etc., how do you ensure that a new micro bevel extends to the edge? It seems to me those steps will take progressively more time. Okay, so the, uh, there's little checks and checks along the way. So the first check is after you do your secondary. So if I have my blade is dull, I'm going to come back and I'm going to resharpen this. Third, the third bevel, the tertiary bevel, is so small, you can wipe it out completely with 10 seconds on the 1,000 grit stone. How do I know that? Because when I'm done the 10 seconds, I feel for the burr. And if I can detect a burr that runs side to side, then I know the tertiary is gone because I've created a new edge on the 1,000. And then I'm going to go over to my tertiary. And now I'm going to raise the blade up a little bit higher and I'm gonna polish, hopefully, ideally, just the leading edge. And if you look at your blade, get some power on if you need, and you see dull, shiny, dull, so I'm looking at the bevel. Let me get a piece of wood. Well, oh, look at that. So here's my uh, narrow blade. What? I think you put it away. The marker? That's what I was wanting. I'll use this. Right. So 
So this is all going to be dull because this is kind of this is just secondary bevel. Or this is a primary bevel. And then if you get a little band right here, which is almost black because it's so shiny, and then you see a dull strip out here, well, that tells me that I did not raise up high enough, and I ended up polishing back here instead of out there. So what you should see is dull, continue, actually it won't, it won't be a transition, it'll be dull right up to here, and the last thing you see is just a little wee highly polished strip oh. right you out, should, right out no, the you end. You should see the secondaries. Well, you, 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 use, you, usually, you usually can't, because I think what people end up doing is they polish most of the secondary as well. But if you, if you ever see a, the last thing you see on the blade is a dull strip, then you know you haven't raised your blade up high enough. And that's a simple test. And the other, the, other, uh, the other test too is this. This is a really good check for determining if your blade is properly sharpened. Take your fingernail. Don't you do this, Frick. And run your fingernail like this along the edge. Are you serious? Have you got that close? I think it will close. And it, you shouldn't feel anything. I feel some nicks in there, so I know that blade's not sharp. But when my blade is properly sharpened, you just run your finger along there, and it is super smooth. If you feel your fingernail catching at all, then you know there's an issue on the edge. Or you didn't get this tertiary bevel right on the edge. Good question. Next, Rick. Next one comes from uh, Luke Deedman in England. Hey, Luke. He says, how do you make sure that the edge of a chisel stays square to the sides when freehand sharpening? And if it goes out of square, what's the best way to fix it? Well, first of all, it's not a huge deal if it's out one or two degrees. Um, you don't want to, if, when it gets really out, then, uh, and how do you check it? Well, you just hold your square up to it, right? Take your, you take your square you hold it on the side and you get up to the light and you look and mine is out mine's out a little bit not a lot I didn't even notice I couldn't see it with the naked eye if I wanted to fix it then I go over to the grinder well let's fix it which one of these this one feels good can I use either one, Jake? Mm -hmm. Can I use either one? Yeah. So I'm using what's called a Wolverine grinding jig. And this is, uh, this is another piece of kit that, it, that will turn your grinder into a premium tool. It mounts on the base and not on the tool. But it's rock solid, nice big flat platform, just works fantastically well. And that's the problem with most grinders is the tool rest comes. It's really lousy. I need to stick my head over here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to adjust this tool rest until when I have the blade on the tool rest and I come up here, I'm matching the original grind that was on there. There's no reason to change it. Original bevel, I should say. Okay. Lock that in place. Lock this in place. Okay. Turn this on. Now, this is a very, very, this isn't something that I would have bothered to stop and fix. Can you see where, it is, where it's out? It's the same. Yeah. Okay. So I know I'm, 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 I'm this is high. So I'm going to favor that side. Hopefully everybody has access to Sharpies because I use them a lot. Sharpies and that and masking tape are two things that we use a lot, somewhat non, I'm going to say non-traditional, no, I'm not even getting where I want, I want to be cutting this corner, so what I've got to do then is I'm going to move my chisel a little bit this way, still 
I'm not doing that. Now, um, I may as well tell you this while I'm doing it. Lots of pressure against this. I don't want to ride up off of the tool rest because that'll give me multiple facets. So my left hand is keeping the chisel tight to the tool rest. I'm still not getting this right. You know what? Whoever mounted this, this is a little out of whack. It's not that. What? It's the grinder. It's the grinder? The grinder's not sitting. Those, those are perfectly square to the table, but the grinder wasn't put in. No, no yeah, but you gotta worry about this. No, so, no. So that edge is not parallel to the stone. And as a result, I'm having to hold this on an angle to finally get it. Now, that's not even warm. Do you have a burr? Yeah. Yeah, but I'm, 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 uh... I made it worse. I gotta hold it over even four more. Light pressure into the stone. Even though it's a CBN wheel, if you apply too much pressure, you'll end up overheating but with that amount of work i mean that's warm but it's not hot keep stopping and checking I would say that the, uh, the one thing you have to do in this process is frequently stop and check. Nothing worse than going too far in the other direction, and then you gotta come back and redo it. So, grind, stop, check. Okay, that's better. I'm actually low here and low there, and I've got a high spot in the middle. So I'll just come in and just... Okay, if you wanna look at that, can you see? That's close enough for the grinder. When I come over here and employ my stones, this is where I'll get the edge perfectly straight. So I'll find my primary, come up just a little bit higher. You can do a little forward and back short strokes, or you can do circular on a wide chisel like that. You can get used circular without problems. The narrow ones are the ones that become problematic. Yeah, I'm not, I don't have, I, I want to see a bevel going all the way across and I don't yet, so I still got some more work to do on this. So what I'm having to do now is I'm having to straighten the edge and the chances of getting the edge perfectly straight off a grinding wheel are pretty slim. So that's where you've got to come over here to your stone, hoping your stone is flat and that's, that allows you to straighten that edge. Okay, so when I look at that, I've got a bevel that runs from corner to corner. So I can stop there. And now because it's straight, when I come over to this stone, which cuts very slowly, but because this stone is flat and that edge is straight, when I set this down on this stone, it's gonna be making contact from side to side. So I'll find my primary, come up a little bit higher. And I'm putting on my tertiary bevel. Flip it over, I always drop the, the 
handle down first and then lower it on there. And then just a few seconds, you never do, you never work the back of the stone, back of the chisel with anything but your finishing stone. Now, if you really want to test how sharp your, you got your chisel, use something soft like basswood or pine because if it's anything but sharp, this stuff will crush instead of cutting. And you feel that surface and it's nice and smooth and you're good to go. There you go. Next question, Frick. Has everyone get entered for the draw? We're, I'm going to tell them again. So here's what we're giving away tonight. We'll do one. We'll do this one, this one, this one, this one as we get donations. So this is a Bob Abbott, the vintage veteran woodworker. It's called tumbling block. Tumbling block. Uh, you can't imagine the amount of work that goes into this. It's nice and thick. It makes a what's great. That, what's that third species? Um, maple, walnut, and cherry. cherry yeah. yeah, beautiful piece. Great gift, for, whether it's a wedding gift or anniversary, whatever. This is the drunken cutting board. <coughs> and then we're also going to give away one of um, Jeff's uh, matching... Shave brush and bowl. Now this is bog oak. With the uh, the salty mariner shave soap. Every one thousand dollar increment, we'll give away one of those. We buy these from these gentlemen at retail. We support their business, and then we give it to you. And Santa Claus helps pay for that. So thank you to him. Any more vets, Frank? Yeah, Ken? Oh, here you go, Ken. Got some more vets to say hello to. Jake Tarola. Yeah, Jake, Hi, Jake. John. Joe B., April 2017. Joe class. B. Joe Bright. Oh, Joe Bright. Yeah. <laughs> and hey, Joe, uh, brother. Jack Lane is on. Hi, Jack. Hi, Jack. Hi, Jack. <laughs> Careful when you say that. That's it. Good to have you guys on. Go ahead, Frick. What's next? Have I, oh, Ken needs, have I forgotten anything? Uh, Said hi to Angie. Moose. Moose, oh. yes. So we're giving away, we're giving away, as we always give away three dead cat sweaters. And uh, Moose has been a big support. He's not with us tonight. He goes in for surgery on the 20th, and he can't risk uh, catching anything. So he's laying low tonight, but our thoughts are with him. And uh, I'd love to have you throw some support his way. PatSecretGarden.com. You can get a Purple Heart Dead Cat Sweater, which is the warmest garment you will ever put on. And uh, he's got those little happy sweaters, too, that my grandsons usually run around here with. They love them. Pretty cute. Go ahead, Fred. Uh, all right. Uh, oh, by the way, I wanted to say thank you to Angie as well. She made me a handmade uh, Christmas gift. Oh, yes, and, I, I, uh, got, did, I did, too. I got my new, my new calendar. I'm going to hang it up here in my little station here once I... My hand gets fixed. This is this is what Angie sent me. That's that's uh, that's nice enough. I'm going to keep that all year. Usually put Christmas stuff away. And great chocolate bars. She sends me chocolate bars that have no sugar in them. Delicious. But Ken ate most of it because he likes it. All right, Devin in California. Devin? Uh, Devin Wright. He was, hey, Devin. He was in our, one of our yeah. PHP classes in May of 2018. He says, with your cosmonized half-blind chisels, what's the best way to get in there and sharpen slash resharpen the sides of that chisel? Oh, well, that's... That... Um, we do those on that CBN wheel, but you wouldn't, want to have, you wouldn't want to go in and copy that. I think if I had to sharpen it... Now, remember, the sides of that are primarily used just for relief so that you can get the tip. So the front edge, here's what Devin's talking about. We make these half-blind dovetail chisels so that when you're cutting a half-blind, you can get into the corners with one tool. So he, I think he's talking about right here. That really doesn't need to be sharpened because all of the cutting is actually being done with this corner. 
what that angle is allowing you to do is slide in there better instead of having that straight up and down, which makes it very difficult. And then to sharpen, oh, we're having a, uh, we're, hey, Mick. Who's your friend? No, who's your little friend over here? Hi, Daddy. He's perky. What's the name of the baby? This is um, this is uh, little Bruce, Moosey. also known as Moose, little Moose. Mickey He's calls a month. Him maybe. Uh, how old is he? Two months. Mickey says he wants to sleep with him. <laughs> <laughs> What's his name? A baby Moosey. Maybe Moosey. Baby Moosey. Usually calls him Moosey Brucey. He may have no Brucey Moosey. <laughs> Do you want to sleep with you tonight? Yeah, he actually does. Yeah, get a kick in the head. <laughs> All right, say bye. Bye. Stay, Mickey. So here's how I would I sharpen this. Just like a regular chisel. On the primary bevel, get your burr, step over to your 16,000, up a little bit higher, turn it over, Polish off the burr, because that's the part that's doing the work. If you want to go in and sharpen those sides, I would think the best way to do it would be to have, where's that little uh, diamond Cutter handled, the handled one? Uh, oh. do, do I still have it, or is it over there? It's over there. Okay, so I have this, I have a little diamond hone. Oh, you got one on the ground. Huh? Or you had one. Oh, you know, I got one right here. I got, I got one of these. I would go in with something like this. This is a diamond hone. And I would go in and... But it would take some work and polish that. You'd end up probably just putting a little secondary bevel on that side. But trust me when I say that really doesn't need to be sharp. It's just there to provide a relief angle. Okay. Thanks, Devin. We're... Oh, we got time for a few over more. over three... What? We're over what? We're over three times. We can do one well, more. Let's have a few more questions. You want to talk on here? Yeah. I got to ask a question. Next, uh, Frick. <laughs> how, uh, old is the, how old is the little moose? One month. One month. All right, Paul in Greenville, uh, Wisconsin. Hey, Paul. He says, Rob, I just got my new IBC chisels. They are beautiful, but I'm having a hard time getting that mirror finish in them with my water stones. Do you have any ideas? Thanks for all you do. Um, I, I don't know what grit you're going up to. And uh, if water stones, you got to make sure you're keeping your water stones flat. I used to tell people, if you're using water stones, you got to stop and flatten them every 30 to 45 seconds. If not, that's going to be dished on you, and you'll never get it. But if he has water stones, he can only go up to, what, eight? Yeah, 8,000 is the highest You're water stone that I know of. No, actually, there, I think there's a company that makes a, t a 10. I, 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 you know the guys that sent us the stuff yeah. to try? I think they went up to 10. Well, you're not... At 8,000 grit, it doesn't... It's not a mirror polish. Yeah, you get... Well, not like a 16. Um, make, keep, make sure your stones are flat, and you keep them flat. Oh, that used to be such a... Uh, an arduous process because if you get up to 8,000 and you're and you've worked in a dish well, at some point and you don't see it until you get to 8,000 because your your distortion on your reflection your you have distortion in your reflection and the only way to fix it is to go all the way back Frick, to 1,000 and start read that again. Question again. The question was I just got my new IBC chisels beautiful but I'm having a hard time getting that mirror finish in them with my water Not stones. Any that, ideas? That would imply that he's having a hard time getting the, the polish, not necessarily the flatness, but the polish, which could be because he's not spending enough time at the lower grit. Yeah. Yeah. Remember, your 8,000 is not going to move metal very fast. So you, when you get to your 8,000, the back has to be flat. The stone has to be flat. And what often happens, as Jake's mentioned, is you, you've lost the flatness at some point in the er lower grits, and then you get to that 8,000, and you're only touching in a l part area and not the entire surface area. You have to keep them flat. Well, I, I, was, I was alluding that I'm not spending enough time on one grit, 
and advancing too quickly and then trying to polish 1,000 grit scratches on your 8,000 grit stone. Yeah, but you would still end up having little shiny spots and that's when you actually would see. So to, allude, to, to finish what Jake's saying, if you get to your 8,000 and you can still see scratches, you're not looking at 8,000 grit scratches. You're looking at 1,000 grit scratches that you didn't chase away with whatever your in-between grits are. <coughs> and the only solution is to go all the way back and start over. And it's just a, oh, it's a painful process. I used to tell people, expect to spend an hour on a chisel. Now, the good news is you never have to do it again, providing you don't loan your chisel to somebody. But it's, um, and, and the pressure too, you apply too much pressure, that throws it out of whack. Oh my, there's so much that falls. There's so much <coughs> in such thing. And, and I was talking to a chisel manufacturer this week and he said, you know, for such a simple tool, it's an extremely complicated manufacturing process. And for such a simple tool, it's a really complicated process of getting the back perfect. Having said that, when you actually get it perfect and use it, it is a pleasure to use. In other words, you're fighting with it the whole time. I, I did a video uh, that's an hour long on uh, bench chisels, and it goes through that whole process, and you're watching me do it, which might be helpful to you. What were you going to say, Ken? Yeah, Abby's down here. Hey, Abby. Eric Eberhardt, he's down in uh, Georgia. Uh, he was in our class here. Yeah, so it would have been 2018, I think. Just move over quick, make this go. Oh. All right, it's five two. So, is there any? Is there one question there that really looks good that you want me to answer? Finish um, off. I'm getting the draw ready, so I'm not really looking at them. Sorry. Oh, all right. So we are going to give. We're yes. going to make three, six draws. The first three will be for uh, dead cat sweaters, and then we'll do, we'll do um, two bobs and one Jeffs. And hopefully I'll remember next time and we'll do it the other way around. Ken, any, any, uh, anything come up that we need to, what happened? What's the matter, Jake? The camera died? So we don't have any camera now? Or we have Ken's? Okay. Are we ready? Do you know... Uh, you know what the donations were at? No. We're, uh, 3, yeah, just under 3,000. So my last check was just over. Okay, so we'll give, with that, so let's do, are we ready for the draw? Yep, just one Okay, first one is for a dead cat sweater, um, a purple heart dead cat sweater, or you can choose a golf shirt. Uh, give me one second here. Okay. Where's it going? Second, Mickey, I need this. All right. The first winner is Sean Oliver in the United States. Hey, Sean. Congratulations. Let us know your size. Contact us with your address as well. Okay. Next winner. Do you want to say the winner this time? No one can see you. Second dead cat sweater is... Say Tori. Tori? Patrillo. For jail. In New Jersey. Tori in New Jersey. In New Jersey. Yeah. Dead cat sweater. Okay, next one. Third and final dead cat is going to Richard. Richard. Uh, Schween. Schween. In United States. Hey, Richard. Yep. All three sweaters going down to the U.S. You guys had a cold snap. You'll need them. You should, should give a big shout out to James, uh, uh, James Wright, uh, Wood by Wright. He and I uh, have been working together a little bit. We did that Purple Heart uh, uh, saw, and uh, he did the box. I did the saw, and it I auctioned it for $4,000 for the Purple Heart. I actually got an email from the Daddy, chap about it today, and he was thrilled with it. So big thank you to him as well. All right, what, what are we giving away now? Now, the, for this one is going to be for... A uh, Bob Abbott tumbling block, cutting block. I'm just going to tell you how thick it is. I think it's an inch and three quarter. Do you remember, Jake? 
It is an, oh, it's actually an inch and seven eighths thick. Maple, walnut, and cherry. And it measures eight and a half by 12 and three quarter. And we've been behind. Bob's making them, so we've ordered uh, 10 of them from him. So it may be a little while, but you're going to get it. Who's this going to? This is going to Althea. Althea? Burrier. Burrier. In Wisconsin. Yep. Althea? In Wisconsin. Congratulations. You'll love it. That comes from Bob Abbott at the, at the uh, veteran, vintage the vintage veteran. Next one is, um, is a Jeff O'Connor shaving brush. I can't promise you it's going to be this one, but it'll be gorgeous, whatever it is, with whose hair? A badger. A badger. A badger gave his all. Super soft. Badger, oh yes. And a bowl and a, a bar of uh, fluttery, Flutterby Soap Company. Salt Mariner Shave Soap. Makes me want to go home and get a shave, which I need. All right. Who's this going to? This one's going to Brad. Brad? Gemmel. Gemmel. Where's Brad? He's in Lake Macquarie, Australia. Oh, Brad, way down in Aussie land. Congratulations. Do they have badgers? No, I'm sure they, they have everything. Yeah, it could be kangaroo. <laughs> and the final one is a drunken, I would call this a cheese board. And this takes a lot of work. Hope you appreciate it. I know you do. Who is, the, who is the drunken board going to? It is going to Lenny. Lenny? Craig. Craig. Lenny Craig where? In Virginia. In Virginia. <laughs> hey, your neighbor, Bob made this. Awesome. All right, thank you just folks. Appreciate you being here. Appreciate your support for the Purple Heart Project. Please be our eyes and ears. If you know of a combat wounded veteran, that is having a hard time, please have him contact us right on our website, robcosman.com, all the information. Big shout out to Luther down in, in uh, Southern California, suffering from a sore throat. Get better. Super Dave, hope you have a nice, safe travels home. All our vets out there, we salute you, brothers. We'll see you guys in two weeks. Have a lovely January. See you.